Alrighty, let's get started. Um, so originally when they slotted me for this time, they cut me, my time really short. They were like, stick to 35 minutes. Now they're telling me I have closer to an hour, so let's stick to 35 minutes and go to lunch early. That sounds like a plan. Um, but I'm Andrew Rosenblum. I'm really excited to be here as part of the student talk, the competition here. Um, we're going to be talking about a topic that's become really interesting to me over the last uh, year or two, hot topics in EMS research. Um, I want to get started with just a little bit of my background. So I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. I got started in EMS in the Marine Rescue Team there, had absolutely zero interest in doing any patient care. I just wanted to be out on the water, you know, boating, scuba diving, rescuing people, that kind of thing, being the hero that we all are. Um, saw the really cool things going on in the ambulances and said, hey, that's pretty cool, and got hooked. Um, I did my EMT with the Hopkins Emergency Response Organization right here in Baltimore up at Johns Hopkins. And then I did my intermediate in Virginia, and now I'm a Maryland and Virginia intermediate. I also joined the Maryland EMS Research Interest Group as I kind of got into this. And I found that the discussions there and the topics that we have and the projects we're working on are really interesting. So I'm going to hope to talk about a few hot topics that are going on in EMS research today. A um, couple quick disclaimers. Basically, everything we're going to be talking about is my opinion. Um, we're going to talk about some cool new things you can do in the world of EMS, but please don't go home and actually do them without you know, protocols and research and that kind of thing. Um, we are going to spend a good bit of time, though, talking about how you can implement protocols, and we're going to do a nice example of how Hero implemented some new research to turn it into a new protocol that we're actually using 24-7 now. Um, other than that, I'd like to talk about a little bit of just EMS research history, kind of where we came from to get to where we are right now, and then those hot topics like we talked about. Um, hot topics in particular are going to be sepsis, antibiotics, and TXA. So with that, diving right into it, um, past role of research in EMS. So this was a meta-analysis. It was published in 97, so about 30 to 40 years into the history of EMS. And it really stuck out to me that, first of all, there had only been 54 randomized control trials up to 1997. 54 randomized control trials over 30, 40 years. Isn't that impressive? It's just not that much data. And what they found was even more interesting, concerning, however you want to look at it, to me at least, 74% um, of the therapies they studied had no impact on the patient. 74% of new ideas were making no difference. 7% were causing harm. Now, 7% is pretty low, but at the same time, 7% is a non-zero percent. And that's interesting that really, I think it kind of um, identifies where the field of EMS came from. A lot of this we made up on the fly, and I think backboarding clinical example there. The research on backboarding is really just kind of made up. And then as we've really gotten into it lately, we've seen there's a ton of research coming out that says that backboards potentially do more harm or really have no benefit to the patient whatsoever. And I'm just curious, out of this room, who has seen their backboarding protocols change in the last couple of years? Yeah, that's what I would expect. Um, it's really come a long way in the last you know 40 years or so. With that in mind, all research is not created equal, so I thought it was kind of interesting to take a minute at the beginning and look at this is how the American Heart Association grades their research. Basically, upper left being the best of the best, bottom right being the worst of the worst. If you're in the upper left, it means we have a lot of good research studies that correlate to what you're doing, and the benefit is much, much better than the risk. All meds carry risks, right? So we know the benefit here is much, much better. Likewise, if you're in the bottom right, I'm not going to call it junk science, but it's not so great. The risk is probably better than the benefit. With that in mind, let's talk about some hot topics, and first of which being sepsis. So basically, sepsis, I think, was an interesting animal. When I did my EMT training in 2014, I can't remember it being talked about at all in my BLS curriculum. And I imagine that's pretty similar around here. But over the last couple of years, especially as I did my intermediate stuff, um, sepsis came back over and over. And what we're really identifying is it's a silent killer. It's under-recognized. And the more we can recognize it, the more we can see it, pick it up pre-hospitally, the better outcomes we can have. Just a little bit of the 10-second version. Um, sepsis usually involves an infection, along with this SIRS, this um, systematic inflama inflammatory response syndrome. Commonly, you get that hypo or hyperthermia. You get tachycardia. You get tachypnea. Um, altered mental status, hypotension, and then you start to get that organ system failure. So it's kind of the whole body is shutting down in conjunction with some kind of infection. Um, for more kind of detailed stuff on sepsis, I saw there's some really good talks. I think there's one right after this, actually. So I'd encourage you to go to that if you're interested there. 
Um, most commonly, and I thought this was kind of interesting, the infection was of the respiratory tract. Maybe it's just anecdotal to me, but when I think of infections, I think of wound infections. I think of patients in nursing homes who have bed sores that got infected or wounds that weren't well taken care of in some of the marginalized populations, homeless people. But it stuck out to me that the respiratory tract is really where most of those infections are coming from. And again, risk factors are what you would imagine. Risk factors for infection, um, poor health to begin with, organ system failures off the bat. Um, just a little bit of the epi behind it. We're seeing about 300 cases per 100,000 people. Um, the highest risk populations tend to be older males, black race, um, and chronic health conditions. What stuck out to me, though, is the prevalence is increasing, but the case fatality rate is decreasing. So essentially, we're seeing more people are being diagnosed with sepsis. We're seeing you know, more and more infections that are being you know, correctly caught, correctly triaged. And we're tre but we're also decreasing the fatality rate. So fewer of those people are dying. And I think that's really, really where EMS kind of comes in, because some of the latest research is saying 34% of sepsis cases present to EMS. So about one in three are going to be seen in an ambulance by someone like you or me or someone you know, very much like us. Um, another really interesting thing that I noticed was sepsis is treated really differently depending on where you are. In Europe, in Spain, for example, 32% of cases that were diagnosed as severe sepsis, and this is going off ICD-9 and 10, the international diagnosis standard, so pretty standardized across the ocean. 32% um, went to the ICU versus 51% in the US. So there's a pretty big difference about how we're treating sepsis throughout the world. And for every hour of delay to antibiotics, that prognosis is worsening. So again, the thought process here is really becoming, treat this like a STEMI, treat this like um, a stroke. These are time sensitive patients. These are patients that need critical care, regardless of if they end up in an ICU or somewhere else. These are patients that really need to be identified by EMS as soon as possible. So the big thing there is, how are we doing recognizing it? This is a 2016 meta-analysis. They looked at 16 studies. And what they found was basically when it's just provider judgment, when I look at a patient, I look at their vital signs, I take their temperature, and I assess that patient, the sensitivity is 0.1 to 0.31. That's pretty bad. We're missing a lot of cases of sepsis that way, or we're getting them incorrect. Um, when you use screening tools, though, your sensitivity bumps way up. We get up to 0.75 to 0.85. That's much, much better. So what stands out to me there is screening tools really have an ability to make a difference because looking at patients, we're just not that good at it. Maybe that's an education gap. It's people like you know, me who didn't get that in my BLS curriculum. Or maybe that's just provider recognition and provider judgment. But it really brings out that screening tools are going to make a big difference. Yeah, I mean placards, checkboxes, that kind of thing where you can go down an algorithm. And we're actually going to look at some in two, three minutes. So what I took away from that is really we can do better. We're not meeting our you know, patient care standards. It's not good enough to recognize 0.3% you know, of sepsis cases. We really need to up our game and start looking at those screening tools to make sure that we're correctly identifying cases and not under-treating or over-treating. And the biggest, biggest thing that has come out of sepsis identification research pre-hospitally is capnography. Show of hands, just in general, how many people are roughly familiar with capnography in the room? OK, so let's say 60%. Um, capnography has really proven its weight as the substitute for lactate. Um, in a hospital setting, sepsis is usually identified with blood work, um, a lot of the labs, particularly the lactate levels. Um, and what they found is we can't measure lactate pre-hospitally as well as we can measure, say, a, glucometer, um, a glucometry reading. But if capnography serves as that really good substitute, it's really not that hard to throw on what looks like a nasal cannula, for those who aren't familiar with it. Slap on a nasal cannula, plug it into a monitor, and get a capnography reading. Um, yeah? Why are they saying that um, our pre-hospital lactate reading is like, that much more inaccurate compared to like, a hospital setting? Good question. I think it's really more of the technology hasn't caught up with the pre-hospital setting. We don't have good portable you know, glucometer sized lactate monitors that are calibrated, able to do it, and able to really be integrated. I imagine that's probably a good five year, 10 year kind of track thing. But at the moment, at least, we don't have the technology to do it the same way we can you know, take a blood pressure, take a pulse ox, um, take a capnography reading, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? OK. Um, so basically, 
this was an interesting study that really looked at that capnography. It was done in Orlando, Florida, and they did it prospectively. Um, providers were given criteria, and we're going to look at their criteria in just a second. Um, but what it dug into was if your capnography, your end tidal CO2, was less than 25 millimeters of mercury, and you had two of those other um, signs and symptoms, along with a suspected infection, the provider was required to call a sepsis alert. But if you didn't meet strictly their criteria, the provider was still allowed to call a sepsis alert. So there was still that provider judgment, hey, something's not right. Maybe they don't meet the explicit signs, but we can still call it. And these are providers who got additional education in sepsis. And what stuck out to me was 78% of the time when they used this protocol, they got it right. The hospital agreed with their diagnosis. Only 43% of the time when they tried to call it on their own without you know, strictly meeting the criteria, what, did the hospital agree with them. So there's still, even with that extra training, the charts here, the capnography, really proved its weight. Um, another really good study came out of um, Greensville, South Carolina. Anyone from South Carolina, just out of curiosity? OK. Um, what they did was very similar. All their ALS providers were required to do 12 hours of classroom training. Um, they did the same kind of setup right there. They created a sepsis alert, and we're going to look at it on the next slide. Um, but they took it one step further. If the provider called a sepsis alert, if they checked those boxes, they were required to, number one, notify the hospital. Number two, draw blood work if they could. If they, you know, obviously, if they had time, if the equipment was present, there wasn't a reason they couldn't. Um, and then start antibiotics. Start antibiotics out in the field which was really interesting because that was kind of the groundbreaking step here. That was when they took it one step further. Can we bring the antibiotics out to the field for these patients? Um, this is an example of what their chart looks like. Um, and I think that'll probably address your question a little bit better. Um, basically, it was a checklist of, does the patient have these symptoms? Do they meet this criteria? Are there any rule outs? What was their temperature? What was their blood glucose? Because again, hypoglycemia could be a mimic of kind of you know, altered mental status, you know, vitals that are a little bit wonky, that kind of thing. So they used these charts to go ahead and call a sepsis alert. They went ahead and tried to draw blood and administer antibiotics. Um, the protocol called for a 30 cc per kilogram saline bolus, so start a lot of IV fluids running. Um, and then they gave various antibiotics, um, latest generation cephalosporins, I believe, for either pneumonia, they went one route, or any other infection, they went another route. These antibiotics all came in the form of a drip, and they all had to be reconstituted. So what that means is it came in a powdered form, and the provider had to essentially constitute it back into liquid, put it into an IV bag, and then drip it over 20 minutes. Um, they had what I think is really promising results. They called 1,100 and change um, sepsis alerts over 18 months. 73.5% had a um, sepsis diagnosis in the hospital. So about 3 quarters of the time, the hospital agreed, and the patient ended up being diagnosed with sepsis. But even more so, 94% of the time, the hospital continued the care. The hospital continued that antibiotic drip, continued down that sepsis protocol. So even if they didn't end up truly having sepsis as the final definitive diagnosis, the hospital said, yeah, you know, you're on the right track here. Additionally, 95% of their blood samples had no contamination. They had something on the lines of 4% and change did have some contamination. So that was pretty good evidence, in my opinion, that pre-hospital providers can draw labs. And to the ALS providers in here, I think you can relate to me that when I did a lot of my clinical time, a lot of it was drawing labs in the hospital. It was starting an IV, draw labs, and then you know, turn it into a saline lock or an IV or whatever else. So the drawing blood didn't really surprise me, but here was good evidence that it can be done, and it went off without a hitch. They also had no adverse um, effects from the antibiotics, which was great. No allergic reactions, no problems, or anything like that. So another encouraging step in the right direction. The takeaways I got from here were basically screening tools really make a difference. As much as our judgment, we like to think it's good, screening tools, screening tools keep winning out. Um, they also said very clearly that, and I'm just going to read this because I thought it was really great, end tidal CO2 had a higher discriminatory power to predict sepsis, severe sepsis, and mortality than the other collected variables. So really that capnography made a difference in these patients. Um, and blood draws and antibiotics are definitely things that can start to be implemented. More research can try them out, pilot programs. There's ways that we can start you know, bringing these things out into the field in limited settings to see how we can implement them. You have a question? Yeah. Um, this, this is just kind of might be specific to my organization, but I was wondering what can an organization with about like a 10 minute transport time in ELS do with ELS? 
good question. Um, ten minute transport time is a lot and not a lot, kind of depending on how you would look at it. What I would say there is the best thing you would do and I would recommend to you is hone your skills at recognizing sepsis. At the BLS level, you're not going to be able to do a lot of these significant interventions, these you know, IV access, the blood work, the antibiotics. But if you recognize it, that opinion, that getting the hospital on the right track is worth its weight in gold. It really is getting the patient on the right track to be, you know, to, to be getting, getting to definitive care. These are patients that can't go to triage. You know, maybe the minor complaint that it was called in, you know, an infection that needs to be seen at the hospital, but those vital signs that go with it, hey, this patient doesn't just have a minor infection or this isn't a case of pneumonia. This is something more serious that needs some, you know, more interventions. So I'd say really it's that patient advocacy. Being your patient advocate is probably the best thing I'd recommend for you there. Yeah? Definitely. So your question was in tar um, targeting antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance is really something that I think we all need to um, take a lot of care to look into and be cautious about. There was an article, I believe, in the New York Times in the last month that was talking about what are we going to do when antibiotics go away. It's really a prominent problem. I would say for these patients, particularly sepsis patients that meet the criteria, meet an alert, they're going to need it. They have an infection that's going to need antibiotics. But we also need to be cautious. I think with any new procedure that comes out in the field, just because you can do it, needs to have that provider discipline that does this patient really need it, or am I doing it because I want to do it? Am I doing it because I want to check that box? Um, and just a small example off to the side, I saw a system where RSI was implemented, paralyzing and then intubating patients. And a lot of providers got really excited you know, with those new abilities, no new, those new skills. But the best providers, in my opinion, were the ones that had that clinical judgment to say, hey, this patient is one that I can manage without that. So do they need the antibiotics? Do they meet the criteria? That's what I would be thinking about. Um, can I get to you in just a second, just for the sake of time? Yeah. And we'll do as many questions. Um, next topic I want to talk about really on that theme of antibiotics is trauma. Um, this is something that actually came as a little bit of a surprise to me in the last six months or year or so. It had never occurred to me, so I imagine there's some people all in here who are either smarter than me and it did occur to them or were like me, but antibiotics and trauma really go together. I hadn't thought about, you know, they teach you in EMT class all the splinting and the wound care and keeping things clean and that kind of stuff, but if you're in a bad accident, if there's significant penetrating injury, there's all those kind of outside microbial stuff attacking you, it makes a difference. You know, there's that infectious process getting started. So antibiotics are likely the course that are going to come with it. Um, and there's been a lot of research right there on antibiotics and trauma in the hospital setting. Um, relative risk reductions up to 0.44 for preventing pneumonia. Penetrating injuries had a substantial odds risk, um, odds ratio reduction. So what on that AHA scale, they're calling it level two evidence. So there's pretty good evidence that antibiotics play a role in trauma care. But up until recently, it's pretty much only been in the hospital setting. So there's been a lot of new research now that's looking at the time to antibiotics. How soon between when that injury occurs and when those antibiotics get started, traditionally being in the hospital, does it make any impact on outcomes? And one number that really stuck out to me from a study um, that was published in 2015 was antibiotics given more than 66 minutes from the initial injury were an independent predictor of infection. 66 minutes sounds a lot to me like the golden hour. That's time that the patient's primarily with EMS that's going to be under our care, and we're going to be triaging, assessing the situation, making determinations about how severe the injury or the illness is. So really, that, that same kind of logic there, time is muscle, time is brain, time is infection in these kinds of cases. Not, that same study also pointed out that the only factors related to, um, statistically to infections were time to antibiotics and days to wound care. So really, that antibiotics as soon as possible is playing out in the research. Um, again, like we were talking about there in that BLS scenario, there's not a lot of opportunities in the EMS world for everyone to have antibiotics. Again, it adds that extra layer of complexity. It's another ALS skill to put on top of the standard ALS skills, which are all on top of the BLS skills. Again, an antibiotic is never going to take the place of 
direct wound care, direct pressure, that kind of thing. So helicopters present that really good opportunity for critical care EMS, that really good opportunity to add an extra layer on top. So there was a study published in 2013. Um, it was a prospective study looking at basically, can EMS give the antibiotics safely? Um, will it change the patient outcome? And what's the cost effectiveness? Does it end up being much more expensive for the patient in the long run? Do we end up using more or less blood products, which have a cost associated with them? And basically what they found was eight helicopter EMS systems participated. There were 138 scene traumas. And they found that they were able to reduce the time to antibiotics by about 30 minutes um, versus when they would have gotten them at the hospital. But they didn't see a statistically significant reduction in infections. What that took away from me was basically the research is a little bit mixed. We're seeing some positives. We're seeing some negatives. The question is a little bit unanswered. The answer is probably going to come from more research, more trials, more sepsis cases, more trauma cases, and just seeing where we are as a field and what we can do. Um, I would like to talk about a couple implementation points, though, with antibiotics. It presents a new animal. It's a new skill in your toolbox, a new drug that requires all that training that comes with it. You're going to need training. You're going to need a cost assessment. Does it make sense fiscally? Does it you know, create new problems because maybe the antibiotics expire every 10 days and you're constantly replacing them without using them? How does it fit into your financial system? Is there a QA, QI process? Are you able to follow up with the providers who gave them and make sure, did they meet their criteria? Did they check all those boxes? Are they giving them inappropriately? So really, that QA, QI needs to play a big role here. Even just from the logistical standpoint, in a trauma patient where you're trying to measure yourself in minutes, minutes, seconds, you know, staying within those you know, few minutes as possible, can I get the antibiotics on board as soon as possible? Are the antibiotics taking away from BLS care? Because no matter how you know, great my antibiotic skills are, if they bleed out, where am I? Really, that BLS trauma care you know, over and over before we get to that you know, kind of ALS, that extra level outcome improving stuff. Um, and I'd like to just take a second here with a case study. Um, this is loosely based on a patient, a patient I treated a little over a month ago. 45-year-old um, male was riding his motorcycle, hit a wet patch on the interstate on an off-ramp, skidded a couple hundred feet, landed in a muddy ditch. He actually hit a tree on his way down. Um, he was not too happy in the bottom of that ditch. Um, again, we're off the side of the interstate. No real hazards present, but a little bit of extrication. Patient's going to have to be you know, taken out of the ditch, carried up to the road where there's an ambulance and all that kind of stuff. Um, obvious deformity to his femur, couple deep lacerations, some chest wall tenderness, but otherwise he's pretty medically stable. You know, he's alert and oriented, no loss of consciousness. His vitals are, you know, decent given the fact that his femur is in three pieces. Um, he's in definitely a lot of pain. So my challenge here is if you're 10 minutes to your trauma center, what are your priorities? Where, you know, what is he going to get? What are you going to do for him that's going to make a difference? Is he a candidate for antibiotics? So what I think of when I think of treatment priorities for him, you know, again, putting aside the science of backboarding, you're going to have to carry him out of that ditch somehow. So probably throwing him on a backboard just for the patient moving aspect. Uh, he needs to be trauma stripped. You've got vitals to do, um, and hopefully a couple sets of vitals between now and the trauma center. Trauma center is probably going to want a heads up that a patient's coming in. I'm assuming he's going to be trauma alerted in pretty much every system. Um, IV access would be nice. You're going to need a full physical exam, um, allergies, meds, history, all that kind of stuff that comes with general patient care. He's in 9 out of 10 pain, so some pain management um, at whatever your level is. You know, BLS pain management, you know, uh, ice, traction, those kinds of things, splinting, and then ALS pain management, fentanyl, morphine, the kind of latest drugs. Um, and then, having done all that 10 minutes from the hospital, are you going to get to antibiotics? Maybe, probably not. Um, but in a different scenario, being in a more rural place, being much farther from a, a trauma center, you might have that option. You might be able to get those antibiotics in in those golden 66 minutes. That can make a difference you know, in a little bit of different scenario. Um, last hot topic I want to talk about is TXA. Um, TXA really made a lot of the news last year. Um, it's basically, I'm not going to get too deep into the pharmacology here, but it basically interferes with the body's clotting factors, um, and it's really proven its weight in preventing blood loss. Um, patented, or at least approved in the 70s, um, and it was used a lot primarily in dental procedures. 
Over the last decade or so, there's been some other uses, particularly in orthopedic surgery, um, but it's primarily licensed for dental procedures and one or two um, other conditions. But in 2010, there was a really big randomized control study um, look, they called CRASH-2, and they found some promising results. They found that TXA had some impact on reducing bleeding and reducing mortality in trauma patients. Um, again, this drug is similar to antibiotics. Um, usually it's given in a relatively quick drip over a few minutes, followed by or a relatively quick bolus over a few minutes, followed by a drip over the next couple hours, um, typically started within an hour of the injury. Um, but again, this is a time-sensitive patient. These are patients that have other needs that are bleeding out, you know, the same kind of thing. If we take the motorcycle example, and maybe instead of being a closed femur fracture, it was an open femur fracture with some substantial bleeding, you know, BLS, bleeding control, hemorrhage, all that kind of stuff, direct pressure, really is going to make the difference here before the TXA. Um, again, it was a hot topic really last year, but they found some mixed results. They found that basically we don't have enough information at this point to say, is it worth its weight or is it not? Is it an extra thing that's detracting from BLS care or is it really the new latest cutting edge? That being said, there are a few studies that are um, implementing it. I believe this is a protocol from New Orleans, excuse me, where basically they set up a system to administer TXA, um, very similar to what the, some of the things we were just talking about, injury within the last three hours, um, patient has substantial blood loss, um, they put in some contraindications, isolated head injuries aren't good patients for TXA, um, time of injury obviously being greater to three hours, an allergy, that kind of stuff. Um, they looked at does the patient meet the criteria in the field, getting them to the trauma center and getting an, a one gram bolus um, to the patient. Another interesting implementation point that they pointed out though was if you're going to do a bolus dose in the field, you're going to give that one gram pretty quickly in the field and then you're going to try to do a drip dose over a couple hours at the trauma center, the trauma center has to be able to administer the drug. And I think that's really easy to overlook. It's easy to think about how the ambulance you know, service, the company, collegiate service, whatever it may be, can purchase a drug, no big deal. We can put it in our med cabinet. But is the hospital going to be able to continue that care? Are they going to be able to continue the drip? Does their pharmacy stock it? Is their, pharmacies, you know, their pharmacist and their doctors willing to prescribe it and have that continuum of care? Because things don't stop just when we get to the hospital. Um, just a couple examples here. One thing they found in Newark, Ohio, was the cost benefit saving really um, pronounced itself at least early. This study was still in progress, but they were finding it was less than $40 per dose of TXA compared to 200 and change for a unit of red blood cells. So there's a substantial cost saving there, at least in terms of one measure, although, you know, how that plays out long term, how that plays out in definitive care and in OR cost needs and all the other procedures that come along with that is still a little bit to be determined. Um, they gave about 19 doses over two years when they published their progress update. And so far, 89% of the patients that got it have survived. Um, they didn't give a lot of data about you know, any sort of cohort, any of the patients that didn't get the TXA, what was their survival or any comparison. But at least the early numbers are somewhat encouraging. Um, the British Columbia Ambulance Service also did a trial, and they found that basically they couldn't say that things went great, but they didn't have any problems. So I think that's kind of the common theme running through some of this research stuff is a lot of these are interesting ideas. They get some success. They maybe they have a little bit way against them, and we need to fine-tune some of the implementation points. We need to look at are we doing this effectively? Are we doing it correctly? Is this the right move for us just as a service? So I'd say overall, more research needs to be done. Um, lastly, I'd like to transition into my last section. It's going to be implementation key points, which is essentially how do we turn this new research into a protocol? How does a study that comes out of a major you know, university, a major uh, study center, turn into a protocol that you have and you can implement tomorrow on your next patient? Um, and basically, the process here tends to encumber these, or tends to include, excuse me, these topics. Um, you're going to need the background science. You really need the why. What need does this fill? Why is this important? Will our patients benefit from this? Do we see patients that are even going to you know, need this in general? So really that overarching why are we implementing this? 
You're also going to look at how does it fit into your system. You know, the same kind of thing we were talking about with TXA, same thing with antibiotics. Is the pharmacy on board with this? Are the hospitals around you on board with this? Is this going to be something weird that's going to freak them out? Because maybe we need to take a step back and say, do we need you know, system-wide education? How is this going to fit into our overall system? Cost is obviously very important. I think even more so in a collegiate system, because I can't speak for everyone, but Hero fits under a tight budget. So we don't always have money to throw around on new novel ideas you know, that aren't going to necessarily pan out. Um, you need a QA, QI process. At this point, it's too important in this era of research and in implementing these new trial protocols to not know how it affected the patients. Are we getting feedback to the providers? Is it making the impact we think we're making? And of course, all that includes training needs. So three ways just specific to Maryland that I'd like to talk about real quick are how protocols are implemented, at least in this state. Um, and Maryland offers three kind of overarching boxes you can put a new protocol idea in. And they call them protocol submission requests, pilot programs, and OSPs, optional supplemental protocols. So protocol submissions are basically the most provider driven, I would say. They're the most, I came up with an idea, I want to implement it, this is what it is. And like, because it is such a provider driven, it's such a we're proposing this to the state, I would say the state requires the most information here. They want to know the reason why, all that background. They want to know how it's going to fit into the system. They want to know what providers it's going to affect. Is this a BLS skill, an ALS medication? What new equipment's it going to need? What new training? If it's a med, what are the indications for that med? What are the possible adverse effects? Really that nuts and you know, busy, how are you going to implement this? What's it going to look like? What's it going to do to the field, to the organization, and to everyone else? And because it's the most, I would say, low level provider driven, there's the most regulatory steps to get through. You're going to have to talk to a review committee, followed by a state EMS advisory council, ultimately the state EMS board, and then if everyone blesses you, you can implement your protocol. The, I would say, one step up are pilot programs. Pilot programs are essentially for research ideas. They're for a lot of the things we were talking about now, those antibiotics, those new sepsis plans, that TXA, pre-hospital ultrasound is another interesting topic. I have some research going on that says that this is probably a good thing. This isn't something that I just cooked up, you know, me and my agency. We have some, some foundation. We're doing a prospective study. And that would be a way you could implement this. Um, pilot programs, again, go through an approval process by the state. And one of the biggest things is that QA process, that quality assurance, making sure we're following up and we're really implementing things the way we want with good success. The last, and I would say probably least restrictive, is called that optional supplemental protocol. And an optional supplemental protocol is basically we're one step above that. We have some solid foundation. The state says this is probably something that can be implemented, but it's going to take a little extra effort. Maybe it's a change to a backboarding protocol you know, that was different from what everyone learned in their EMT class. So you're going to need some extra education. Providers are going to need some new training requirements. There's going to need to be some extra QA involved, you know, quality assurance and quality improvement. But this has been pretty well established that it's something that can happen. So if you're willing to put that extra effort in, we're on board with the science behind it. And just some examples, in the current Maryland DMS protocol, they have manually drawn up epi, ventilators, BLS IV access, and RSI. So last thing I'd really like to talk about is a case study for how HERO, the Hopkins Emergency Response Organization, implemented an optional supplemental protocol. What we found over the last couple of years, and I'm sure you all have seen similar concerns, <coughs> epinephrine from EpiPens is really expensive. And it's going up. Yeah, somebody said something over there. Yeah. Um, the price is really going up, and it's been continuously upward trending. And Hero just doesn't use that many EpiPens. We were stocking something like six or eight a year to use maybe one dose. And at five, six, you know, 700 at sometimes, you know, dollars per dose, it really just wasn't cost effective for us anymore. So we looked at, is there a better way? And the state introduced in 2015 this optional supplemental protocol for BLS providers. Essentially, they said the research is there. We're on board with this. If you're willing to do that extra training, implement that extra process on top of what you're already doing, you can do it. So that's what we sought out to do. We were very fortunate to have a great relationship with Johns Hopkins Lifeline, the critical care transport program at Hopkins Hospital. Um, and they worked with us. You know. 
100% to make sure we got this done and to make sure we did it right. We didn't want to put a new skill out there, you know, start handing needles and syringes out and vials of medication and say, you know, here's the five minute spiel, good luck, go forth. We really wanted to do it right from top to bottom to make sure that on those calls that can be a little bit stressful, someone having an allergic reaction, someone having trouble breathing, this is what you're going to need to, you know, what you need to know to do it and do it right. So essentially, we took a top to bottom approach here. We looked at how are we going to you know, get this out there. First and foremost, like I said, we had that great support from our team at Lifeline. Our medical director was 100% on board with this. He felt, like I'm saying now, that with the right training and the right implementation plan, our providers would definitely be able to do it. Um, so we set up a series of PowerPoints. Again, very um, intertwined with our team at Lifeline. A lot of support there. Um, to basically review the entire spectrum of how manually drawn up epi would be used. We went back to the basics about what, how do you handle sharps. You know, remember that sharps need to go into a sharps container. We talked about the indications, you know, and the contraindications for epi. We talked about the pathology of anaphylaxis and allergic reactions. We really used it as an opportunity to do a comprehensive review. But then the training, you know, in terms of a lecture wasn't enough. We wanted to make sure everyone got a hands-on opportunity to actually implement this skill. But at the same time, I'm sure you guys can all relate, getting 65, you know, 75 heroes into a room to take a class, take a, you know, do some hands-on time is not that easy. We all have lives, we all have schedules, so we had to account for that. We had to understand that some people were probably not going to be able to make the primary trainings, and how could we make sure that they got it eventually? Because, again, I don't want somebody out in the field you know, on an allergic reaction call under a little stress trying to fumble with just something they saw on a PowerPoint. Um, Again, we had to do some strategic cost planning. You know, EpiPens were expensive. We were talking $600 an EpiPen, but at the same time, even though a dose of manually drawn up Epi is just a few dollars, three, four dollars or so, we needed to do training times 60 or 70 people. We needed to purchase supplies. We needed to make sure that we had everything we needed to implement it and all that kind of stuff. So there was a little bit of strategic cost planning in there. And it was also a time for us to reflect on our SOPs. One thing that I realized in my role in the hero leadership was our exposure plan was really deficient. We had an exposure plan that was kind of written under the assumption that an expo exposure would never happen. But what bothered me was if a 3 a.m. allergic reaction call came in and, you know, God forbid, one of our providers got a needle stick or something like that, I don't want them calling me, calling someone else in the leadership in the middle of the night saying, what do we do? You know, what do you do? We had a needle stick. You know, that was something that was concerning to me. So that was an opportunity for us to reflect with our team at Lifeline um, to really make sure. I don't know what that is. Um, OK. Um, anyway, uh, that was an opportunity for us to really reflect with our team at Lifeline on some of our SOPs as a whole. Is our, let's get our exposure plan up to date. Let's get, our, you know, let's get an SOP in place that talks about how we're going to do manual doses of epi. <laughs> how are we going to create a QA process? What feedback are providers going to need after they do it? And what ongoing training are we going to need? If you put together a syringe once, draw it up, give it to a dummy, you know, in August, are you still going to remember in January? Are you going to be able, you know, comfortable with it the following August? Especially a skill that we only do about, you know, three times a year or less. So really, it was that deliberate. What's the plan here? We ended up creating these really nice PowerPoints again, thanks to a lot of help with our team at Lifeline, um, and we did that, you know, full level review of allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, and administering epi. We did a detailed training on how to actually put together the equipment because for most of our providers, they didn't have that hands-on comfort familiarity with syringes, types of needles, um, and so on. We're using epinephrine in an ampule, which is a glass vial, um, so it requires two different needles. You need one needle to draw it up out of the vial, and you need another needle to uh, minister it to the patient. So again, that training on what the difference is between those needles are, why we're using the different ones, which one comes first and which one comes second, because they're not interchangeable, or it would really hurt. Um, we did that hands-on training, and we got 100% of our hero members through it, which again included those PowerPoints, that hands-on time. And then every single member of hero got a chance to break an ampule, break that glass vial open, assemble the syringe, administer it under supervision, and then make sure that they were really comfortable. If you wanted to do it a second time, we made sure there was time to do it a second time, and so on there. 
Lifeline, again, with us, created these really nice skill sheets that kind of meet the format of a national registry skill sheet. And every single provider as a, who's a member of Hero has one of these in their personnel file now that documents that they went through the entire process to go through manual epi administration. They knew how to assemble the syringe. They identified the correct landmarks to administer it to the patient. They drew up the correct dose that was confirmed by an instructor, um, and so on and so forth. One of the other really interesting things that we implemented here was a train the trainer concept. So Lifeline helped us develop the initial training. They brought to us the original you know, lecture content, that kind of thing. And then we distributed it to some of our leadership and made them into trainers. And then the actual training session that was delivered to our organization as a whole was entirely member led. We gave all the lectures. We did all the hands-on with a Lifeline person or two floating around to help you know, fill in the questions that we weren't sure about, make sure that everything was you know, safe from top to bottom. But really, it was 100% led from us, that training. And then we established a QA program. When we have originally implemented this program, I was the captain of HERO. Um, so one of my roles was overall quality assurance for the organization. So we developed a system where our medical support team at Lifeline, our medical director, automatically get information every time we do this. Anytime I received a chart in my capacity as captain that said we administered a manual dose of epi, I sent an email to our clinical team down at the hospital and said, hey, we just did this. It was chart number whatever. If you want to you know, take special attention to that chart. Um, likewise, every crew that administers epi automatically received a follow-up email from me. So I sent them an email that said, hey, this is what you did great based on the documentation. These are the, some, of, some of the things that I think you should think about in the future. So we really tried to make sure that QA, QI was a part of the process, not in the sense that you screwed up, you did something wrong, but we want to have an open discussion. Ask me questions that you were uncomfortable you know, with. L ask our team at Lifeline things that you're uncomfortable with. Let's make sure that we're all really comfortable with this protocol. So in summary, basically, what I took away from this was EMS really wasn't a, history, wasn't a research driven sport for most of our history. Over the last couple decades, with some great work from people like the Maryland EMS Research Interest Group over at the University of Maryland and many other people throughout the country, there's been a lot of new great research that has said that some of the things we're doing, like backboarding, not so effective. Some of the things that we are doing or new things that we can do might really make an impact on patients. So we looked at things like sepsis, really those screening tools, putting capnography on those patients, making sure you have an adequate supply of capnography on an ambulance, you know, on a first response vehicle, however you get there, if your you know, protocols allow capnography, really makes a difference in being able to identify sepsis, even if you can't take it that step further and do the blood draws, the IV fluids, the antibiotics, identifying it and reporting it to the next provider who's gonna take care of those patients really makes an impact. Um, antibiotics potentially have a role in the pre-hospital setting for trauma and septic patients. And who knows, as we start to explore antibiotics, we might find that there are new other venues where we can use them in other fields that we're not quite considering at the moment. The TXA research that was proving really exciting last year hit a couple road bumps, but it's still ongoing. So the question is, you know, we're not quite there yet. We don't know for sure. And lastly, implementing new research really needs to be a comprehensive process. Look at it top to bottom and make sure, are we doing this with appropriate medical control? Are we looking at it from a cost sense? Are we looking at it from a system sense? Are we looking at it from a QA sense? Are we able to top to bottom implement this protocol and make sure that what we're doing is really going to be of comfort to our providers and of benefit to our patients? And with that, I have a couple people I would acknowledge. I used a lot of references, and that's all I have. I know there were a couple interesting choices for the student speaking competition, so I really appreciate you guys spending some time with me. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. I know I kind of deferred you um, if anyone else has any questions. I know we're also like knock knocking on lunch, so if anyone wants to go, I won't be offended. Any questions?